والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Tonight we are celebrating an event of cosmic proportions So important in fact is the reason of our festivity tonight that it will literally shape life as we know it in the universe. In fact, so important is this event that without it, life becomes completely invalid. It's purposeless and entirely bereft of any meaning. It is a project that is millions of years in the making. Allow me to elaborate by taking you to the ultimate Genesis story, a story that we are all too familiar with. One that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah right there at the very beginning in verse number 30. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the story of when He willed to create mankind. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خليفة. The time when your Lord said, meaning he spoke to the angels, and he said to them that I am appointing a successor on earth. I'm creating humanity. It is at this exact point that the angels then object to God. And the reason for their objection, I think, is one that has a lot of merit. I'm not defending what they did, but trying to understand why they raised that objection. You see, angels knew that having desire and free will was the most combustible formula. Meaning that they understood that for any creature to possess both of these things meant that they were on a path to self-destruction, to acting in the most corrosive manner, and to doing things that were incredibly destructive for themselves and the environment around them. So what do the angels say? قالوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ وَيُسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ So what do the angels say? قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ وَنَحْنُ نُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِكَ O Lord, by creating man, you will be placing on this earth a creature of desire, a creature that will do two things broadly. Number one, he will cause corruption. He will act in a corrupt manner. This desire that humans have is so insatiable 
that they will stop at nothing in trying to satisfy their temptations. Number two, one of the lines that they will cross is the shedding of each other's blood. The angels understood this because it's one plus one equals two. It's not a complicated concept to wrap your head around. It's not rocket science, as we would say. In other words, the angels are saying, knowing the self-destructive behavior of mankind, knowing what they will inevitably do to themselves, to each other, and to their environment, why would you do that? Why would you create creatures that will defile your name? You are too glorious, O oh God. You are too lofty. You are too great to be creating this creature that will desecrate your name, that will defile your remembrance. We engage in all of these acts that are worthy of you. And this is exactly where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, He said, I know what you do not know. But what does that mean exactly? God created man for a purpose. God is telling them, no, you don't understand. You claim that mankind will be so corrupt, so deadly, so morbid, that they will completely annihilate each other. But there's something I know that you do not know, which is what? In other words, God is alluding to a purpose for the creation of man that they have no information about. Well, what's that purpose? Let's go back to the Quran. This time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the following verse. He says, لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُولَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ And we have sent our messengers with clear proofs. وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانِ And with them, the scripture and the balance. Why? لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ So that mankind may keep up justice. لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ Remember this word, these words? We'll need them. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further elaborates and goes on to say, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ And we have sent down, we have brought forth iron, wherein is mighty power, وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ As well as benefits for mankind, وَلِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ So that God may know who it is that will help him, وَرُسُولَهُ And help his messengers, بالغيب إن الله قوي عزيز so that God would know in other words the reason for creation is these two things number one so that people will hold justice so that mankind may keep up justice ليقوم الناس بالقسط number two so that God knows who will support him and his messengers بالغيب meaning in the unseen, in the time of the unseen, in the knowledge of the unseen, in the world of the unseen, who will support the messengers? Who will withstand those difficult tests? Who will do the right thing at a time of confusion? And Allah Qawiyun Aziz, verily Allah is Almighty, all invincible. So, that's the purpose of creation, according to the Qur'an itself, that the angels were not aware of. Again, we're 
tying up these loose ends, this is really important. God tells the angels, you don't know what you're talking about. There is much that you do not know. You say that mankind is going to destroy each other, but there is something you don't know. Then he says in the next verse that we recited that we have sent all of these messengers so that people would keep up justice. But here's my question to you. Where is that justice? Where is this utopian world that God is talking about, that God is referring to, is alluding to? Because so far, the events that are unfolding before us, before us in this world, what is happening around us in this world, is textbook angelic prediction. It's exactly what the angels said would happen. And it's happening. So, when are we going to see the purpose of God's creation be fulfilled? And this is exactly why. Prophet after prophet, messenger after messenger, divine guide after divine guide have all spoken about the Mahdi. And it's why the holy messenger of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him and his family, has said on numerous occasions, Al-Mahdi, the Mahdi will come, يَمْلَأُ الْأَرْضَ قِسْطًا وَعَدْلًا كَمَا مُلِعَتْ ظُلْمًا وَجَوْرًا He will come and fill the earth with justice and fairness, just as it was filled and completely swamped with injustice and oppression. So, 124,000 prophets come and go. They preach to us. They try to create a more equitable world. They try to fulfill in their own small way the purpose of creation, but it doesn't happen. And as again, as I said earlier, we are where we are today. And things are getting worse by the day. Countless prophets and messengers, countless men and women of God. Rivers of blood have been shed, unthinkable sacrifices have been made, yet mankind has not kept up justice until the Mahdi comes. He, according to innumerable prophetic traditions, will eradicate the roots of oppression and injustice. He, in fact, will destroy the cause of the oppression that we see in our world today, the oppression that has plagued the entire world. And in its place, he will fulfill that divine mandate. So you see, this celebration tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, is so much more than you and I could ever appreciate. The event that transpired on this blessed night has to do with the very purpose of creation. It about the work of all prophets and the fruit of existence itself. It's the answer to the angels who told God that by creating mankind, you're only going to reap corruption and bloodshed. It's the answer to the prayers of prophets and messengers and those who have been oppressed throughout history. The event tonight is incredibly important because it's about the time when God finally brought into this decadent, morally depraved and unjust world 
the one who will bring an end to the injustice once and for all. The one who will turn the tables around and manifest the true potential of mankind. The potential of mankind when guided by divine guidance, when guided by God, when guided by the Mahdi. But here's a question I want you to think about. Why? I know it's kind of a first world question to ask, but aren't things kind of okay? I mean, they're not that bad, are they? You talk about all this grave injustice and this oppression and whatnot, but I mean, it's not as terrifying as perhaps I am presenting it to be. Well, people, and I think this includes all of us, we often have this nostalgic view of the past. In other words, when we think of 30 years ago, 50 years ago, we often associate those memories, especially in popular culture, especially in movies, movies that dramatize the 1950s and 60s, for example. They try to present this extremely glamorous, beautiful, happy time. So it's very nostalgic, right? But we forget that the reality of those times as we go back in the past is that, I mean, it, it's, it's such that almost none of us can acclimate to living in those times, no matter how hard we try. It's just impossible, right? Just think about it, for example. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, you were somehow able to be teleported through a time machine a hundred years back. How would you do? Well, let's entertain that thought for a second. People nowadays would completely lose it if they so much as couldn't get their phone to a charger in time, right? I mean, we've all been through it. So, if we can't live with out our phones for like an hour. Now imagine having to forego all the luxuries, every item of convenience, all the things that you depend on to make your life comfortable, you would lose all of them if you went back just a hundred years. You would have no cars, you would have no planes, you would have no modern medicine, you would have no um, internet. I mean, just imagine. It would be hell, right? It's purgatory, practically speaking. Um, you would have none of those amenities, none of those items, comfort and convenience, and things that we're so dependent on right now. None of the inventions, the technological advancements, that we use on a daily basis nowadays would exist if you go back a hundred years. So how would you live there? Yet, here's the thing. Bringing this example to show you how if you looked at the technical and technological advances of our day, you would think that they're truly spectacular. And that whatever happened in the past is just nowhere near as great as what we have now. I mean, we have, you know, washers and we have dryers and we have fridges and we have all these things. They didn't have those things back then. And yet, the truth is that people who lived 100 years ago, they probably felt not only proud of their achievements, not only happy, relatively speaking, with what they have, but they probably thought that what they had at that exact moment in time was pretty much all that humanity could ever reach and create. 
Let me mention an example here. Um, a famous physicist stated at the turn of the 19th century, so that's over 100 years ago, he made the following statement, and you can look this up. He said, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. And he was an expert in the field, by the way. There is nothing new to be discovered within his field of expertise in physics. All that remains, he said, is more and more precise measurement. In other words, yes, our equipment could be tweaked a little bit more. We could have more precise measurements, perhaps um, to the fifth decimal point. But beyond that, no new theories are ever going to be discovered. No new ideas are going to come into the fore because we've discovered pretty much all there is to discover. Now, needless to say, this was just before two new groundbreaking theories in physics which were developed, namely the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, which completely changed the, 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 the entire um, field of physics, completely, and that's an understatement. So, to call this a gaffe, I think, would be an injustice to all gaffes, to suggest that there is almost nothing more to be discovered just before those two great groundbreaking discoveries. The reason I say all of this is that because while most in the first world, like perhaps many of my viewers right now, those of you who live in uh, the Western world, in the United States, in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, and places like that, most of us may feel that the world is almost perfect, that minus a few tweaks here and there, we would have a perfect world or as near to perfect as we could make it. The reality is that our world is not only totally imperfect, but it is on a steep decline. In other words, it's getting much, much worse. I'll give you some examples, right? Number one, look at wealth disparity, how the rich are getting richer and richer, and how the poor are getting poorer and poorer, how it's getting increasingly more difficult for young people to purchase their own homes. And when it comes to the uber rich, the amount of wealth that they have is just astronomical. I mean, their money practically makes more money for them without them lifting a single finger. And it's not that they enjoy it. It's just how the system is designed. It's rigged in their favor, right? Uh, I think there was an interview once done with uh, Sheldon Adelson, the casino mogul who died uh, a few months ago, I think, or about a year ago, maybe less than a year. Uh, and... The person conducting the interview asked him a question. He said, how do you feel uh, when, let's say, for example, you have a billion dollars versus when you've got $10 billion? How much more joy do you experience? I'm paraphrasing, of course. And Adelson responded by saying, well, nothing. I don't feel any difference, whether it's a billion or 10, whether it's 10 billion or 50 billion, it's all the same to me. So you have people like that who are making billions and billions of, of dollars almost on a daily basis sometimes when their stock prices go up or whatever. And then you have the 99% of people who are still dependent on, you know, food coupons and vouchers and having to basically scrape up whatever is left after the party, after the, the rich get together and have their fun. So, I mean, that's just one example in terms of wealth disparity. And especially if you're, you're, if you're a younger person and you're studying at 
college and you're trying to earn your degree and you're getting into debt, which is usually the kind of debt that's just never going to go away, um, you, you understand that there's something wrong with this system, something endemic, something systemic about how uh, the economic model is created um, to kind of force you into this lifelong rat race that's probably never going to end, that doesn't even give you time to spend with your family, with your kids. You have to work two jobs or you have to be miserable and unhappy and you have to be uh, in these situations where, uh, I mean, you know, let's face it, marriages are falling apart. If you're one of the lucky ones and you don't end up in actually getting divorced through the court system, uh, you might be one of those people who is stuck in a loveless marriage and there is what they call uh, emotional divorce. Uh, that even though you happen to be there around your family, around your spouse and your children, but there, there's really no connection there. There's no joy. There's no happiness, right? All of these things are examples of, of just how much suffering there is, how much injustice that is systemic to the model, the economic model and the political model that we happen to be trapped in, right? And yet... It's easy to forget all that when you switch on the television and watch a sitcom. It's easy to forget that when you try to distract yourself, whether it be with narcotics and drugs or uh, the kind of mindless entertainment that's churned out every day. It's easy to forget. And that's why people turn to drugs and narcotics and, um, you know, uh, binging on movies and series and whatnot because they're trying to distract themselves. They're trying to break free from the cycle of pain and misery. So, that's one example. The other example, just look at the vast majority of women in advanced nations, I might add, we're not talking about the third world countries. We're not talking about pl places that are plagued with um, poverty, for example, or inadequate education. In advanced societies where the vast overwhelming majority of women report being sexually harassed at some point in their lives, especially those who go out there and work. Look at how economic development has come at the cost of families, as we said earlier, and children. I mean, how miserable is it that the coronavirus lockdown meant that a lot of women had to stay home and not go to work? And because of that, I was reading uh, some uh, statistics a study that was done which showed that the infant mo mortality rate in Western countries dropped significantly thanks to the coronavirus lockdown because mothers were not forced to go out and spend their most productive hours of the day at work and instead they stayed home and they looked after their children. So the infant mortality rate went down about fivefold, right? Five times decrease in the number of children dying because they had better care. I mean, what kind of a world is this that forces these women out into the workforce to abandon their children or at least not be there for them when they truly need them? Send those children. I said this the other day. I said, you know, if we happen to live in a world where we send our children to daycare so that we could go to work, but if you send your children, your kids to daycare, then don't be surprised if they send you to nursing homes when you get old, right? But I digress. My point here is this, that ultimately we live in this world where women are forced to go spend their most alert hours of the day, their most productive hours of the day at work, away from their family, away from their children, to be abused and to be sexually harassed by males, whether it be in their place of work or on their way to work or on their way back home. How miserable is that?
How terrible is that? What kind of a world is this? Look at how countries like the UK and Japan have announced new cabinet portfolios called Ministry of Loneliness. I mean, just try to wrap your head around this. That these incredibly developed countries, these mature economies, these massive GDPs, have to create an entire dedicated ministry to look after people who are too lonely and who end up committing suicide or die in misery away from their families and their loved ones. They reel from a lack of companionship. What kind of a world is this? So, sure, yeah, we have better graphics cards to um, render all those video games for us. Wow. And we have electric cars that are faster than any combustion engine we've ever made. Sure. And we've sent rovers to Mars to scrape the crust of its surface. Sure, we've done all that. And yet, ironically, the one thing humanity has failed to develop is its humanity. We think the world is all hunky-dory, but we're like a tadpole that's swimming in a swamp. The tadpole probably feels that this place is perfect, it's beautiful, it's all warm and nice, but the reality is that it is a swamp. Not knowing what lies outside of our immediate environment, not knowing what is truly possible with divine guidance, what the world could be like, makes us think that the world we live in is beautiful, it's great, doesn't have any problems. But the second you begin to probe a little deeper, you begin to ask some questions and switch off that mindless state that we're in and start to actually think for yourself, that's when you realize that we are all living in a swamp. The point here is that if only we knew what was lying outside of this little swamp of ours, we would be living completely different lives. If we knew what the age of the Mahdi would bring about, the excitement would completely overtake and therefore shape our lives. Now, let me give you two examples that I want to zoom in on a little bit. And I don't want to sound negative, and I think this will all make sense uh, in, in just a few minutes when I explain why I'm talking about the uh, systemic problems of our world. So, two examples, and these are some of the most critical anxieties that people have thus allowing governments and politicians to take advantage of our susceptibilities and, and tap into these anxieties to get their way. I'll give you one, uh, I guess, positive example of that. Um, poverty is one of the things that people fear so much that sometimes the mere hint of financial instability. The mere hint of us not having enough saved up is enough to influence our behavior. The example is this. Let's say a government uh, uh, wants to uh, stop people from using plastic bags. And this has been tested, many governments have done this. What they'll do is that they will impose a small levy a tiny fee, a tax, on the use of plastic bags in grocery stores, for example. Now, what will happen, as we've seen, is that even if it's only five cents per plastic bag, or seven cents, or ten cents, or whatever the number may be, two cents, that is usually enough to bring the usage of these bags to a steep decline. Now, you might say to yourself, but why? Is it the, the fact that the government educates people 
about the environmental impact of the use of plastic bags? Well, the answer is no, because if that was it, then why would they have to impose a fee, a tax? So what is this tiny tax doing to our psyche? Well, it taps into these ingrained fears and anxieties. The fear of poverty, the fear of not having enough, the fear of retiring with insufficient amounts of funds, right? Even if it's five cents a plastic bag, the way we see it is that it all adds up. Over a lifetime, we're talking thousands of dollars and thousands of dollars could mean the difference between me being stuck in a bad nursing home or having a place that's a little bit more comfortable. So, what if I told you that in the age of the Mahdi, there will no longer be poverty. And of course, for those who aren't content with prophetic scripture and narrations and want actual numbers and figures and facts and whatnot, which, you know, we have people like that. I'll give you an example. The fact of the matter is that the amount of resources energy, money, time that goes into the extraction of precious metals, for example, gold, silver, rare earths, and others, is just mind-boggling. The mines, the miners who put their lives at risk, the disproportionate amount of natural resources that have to go into the extraction of these precious precious metals is just incredible. Oil, you know, it's it's famously stated that the shipping companies that transport the oil oil barrels make more money per barrel than the countries that sell the barrel itself, that are seeing their natural resources being depleted right before their eyes. And the reason for that is because by the time you factor in the funds needed to explore and find new oil fields, the funds that are required to extract the oil from the earth, the funds required to refine and process the oil, I mean, you end up making cents on the dollar. So, it's a very, very difficult and complicated process to say the least, right? Now, every so often, a country comes along that taps into a seemingly endless natural resource li like gas and ends up making huge sums of money, like Qatar, for example. It has the highest GDP per capita in the world, the highest personal income in the world. And the reason for that is because they have these massive uh, gas fields and they're making a killing off of them, right? Now imagine... As the Holy Prophet وسلم, says, In the age of the Mahdi, there will be no poverty because number one, he will put an end to laws and legislation that favor the rich and destroy the poor. He will cut out the red tape that make it almost impossible for people to break free from the cycle of poverty. He will ensure that the system isn't pivoted towards those who are wealthy and is fair and just. Obviously, that comes as no surprise. But in addition to that, there is that divine backing element, which according to this hadith, the Prophet says, the earth will reveal all of its riches every natural resource, every precious metal, everything of value in this beautiful planet of ours that's been hidden and concealed for millennia will finally be revealed to the Mahdi. God wants to make this project a success and that's only part of the solution. And so it'll get to the point where traditions tell us that when you want to pay your alms, your religious taxes, you won't find anyone willing to take it because nobody needs it. In other words, the very root causes of poverty will be completely extracted and eradicated. Hence, one of the biggest anxieties in the human world will be destroyed. People won't fear poverty anymore. 
That's one example. The other example is security. Now, if you're not afraid for having your identity stolen, for having your possessions, your wealth, your money, your bank account, your wallet, your credit card, if you're not afraid, then there's something wrong with you. Um, in fact, imagine this scenario. You're about to go on a weekend getaway, two or three days. You get everything ready, you're all packed up, you head to the airport, you get on a plane. As the plane is taking off, you remember that you inadvertently left your garage door open, which is the equivalent of putting up a sign that says, thieves, robbers, welcome, take whatever you want. I mean, can you imagine the panic? Can you imagine the, the nervous breakdown that you experience because you don't know what's going to happen to your house anymore? That fear of security will no longer be the case when the Mahdi returns, right? I'll give you one more example. And you'd have to be a woman to fully appreciate this. Can you imagine the sheer terror of a woman walking home from her place of work, from school, from her friend's home, all by herself in the dead of night? It's terrifying to say the least especially if she's young and she's attractive or even if she's not any woman there is plenty of animals out there that fear no longer exists in the age of the Mahdi how traditions tell us that given the plethora of tools that are at his disposal the things he will do the different measures that he will take he will create a world where a woman can walk from one country to another, from one city to another. I believe the hadith says from Kufa to Basra, 300 miles. And she can walk for 20 days and 20 nights and not a single person will approach her, let alone harass her, let alone abuse her, let alone rape her. Not a single person. The roots of the violence, the poverty, the insecurity, the fear, the hate will be completely taken out. And so, if we appreciated what lied outside of the swamp of a world of ours, our entire outlook on life would be different. Let me say something here at the risk of sounding negative. Once again, I believe that the world we live in today is marred and, dare I say, cursed by divine wrath. Oppression is so rampant, it's literally everywhere. Divine laws are broken deliberately and by people who claim religiosity. I don't want to give examples, but... I'm sure you can do the math and connect the dots. It's why we have plagues that are taking over our world and completely paralyzing it. It's why we have catastrophes, natural disasters that are getting worse by the day. I mean, when you read about global warming and what it's doing to our planet and what it's going to do in the near future, and the risks it poses to all of us, to literally the, the existential risks to our lives, it's just terrifying, right? All these things are happening and they're not a movie, they're not some kind of a story. It's, this is not a hyperbole, brothers and sisters. This is reality. It's happening right before our two eyes. This is the world we're living in. But with the guidance of God, and with the last government aided and assisted and backed by the heavens, with the Mahdi in charge, Traditions refer to this verse in the Quran in reference to the age of the Mahdi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the day when this earth will be a different earth. 
the earth will be transformed to a different earth. In other words, it'll still be the same planet, but it'll be something completely different. Something beautiful. Something blissful. So much so that the Holy Prophet is quoted to have said in a long hadith describing the age of the Mahdi. Then at the end he says this. He says, يَتَمَنَّ الْأَحْيَاءُ amwat." On that day, the living will wish the dead were alive. Why? Because the living will see the transformation. They will see the utopia. They will see the beautiful world. And they'll say, I wish my parents were still alive to see this. I wish our ancestors were still here to see this. I wish they could see divine promise being fulfilled once and for all. I wish they could see God's answer to the angels being manifested in reality. We wish they could be here with us to experience all of this. Now, the reason I've said all that is based on the following. And I'll leave you with this note. There's an Arabic expression which says, لَيْسَتِ الْنَائِحَةُ الثَّكْلَةُ كَالنَّائِحَةِ الْمُسْتَأْجَرَةِ Sometimes abbreviated to لَيْسَتِ الثَّكْلَةُ كَالْمُسْتَأْجَرَةِ And what this refers to was a practice which was common back in the pagan era. But surprisingly, at least I was surprised to learn, that in some cultures and some countries like South Korea, they still practice this. What is it? In a funeral, they hire a person and they pay them a fee to come and display an outpour of emotion. They pay someone money to come and cry, essentially. Why do they do this? Because they think that this helps the soul of the deceased or because they want to create an environment where other people feel comfortable to cry. I don't know. It doesn't matter. What matters is the act itself. What this Arabic expression refers to is it says that the one who's acting, the one who's paid to cry, is very different to the one who is genuinely grieving. Imagine a mother who's lost her child. Does she cry like the one who's paid to act? As if she's grieving? Of course not. For you and I, brothers and sisters, here's why I said this. And here's why I struck all those negative tones. And here's why I mentioned all those facts and figures. In order for us to mean it when we say, Allahumma kulli waliyik al hujjat ibn al hasan in order for us to mean it when we say Allahumma ajjil li waliyyik al-faraj, to mean it when we recite Ziyarat Ali Asin, to mean it when we recite Dua al-Nudba, to mean it when we recite Dua al-Hujjah, in order for that to happen, we need to appreciate the swamp that we're in. We need to appreciate how terrible things really are. And for, in order for us to do that, we need to connect back to our scriptures. We need to connect back to the thaqalain, to the two weighty things, the Qur'an and the tradition of the Prophet and his family. We need, my dear brothers and sisters, to increase our understanding and knowledge and familiarity with our religion, with our faith. Then and only then will we realize how bad things are, how desperate things are how terrible, truly terrible they are. And then we will truly grieve. Then we'll be like a grieving mother, as opposed to someone paid to act like a grieving mother. Only then will we move heaven and earth to connect with the Imam. It won't be a casual affair once a year, twice a year. It'll be something we do every day. We will recite Dua Al-Ahd every day. We will recite Dua Nudbah every Friday. We will strive to be in Karbala like a night like this one. On a night like ours, the eve of the 15th of Sha'ban, 
is one where the greatest summit is taking place in the holy city of Karbala. God's greatest celestial an angels. The holy prophet is presiding over the summit. The imams of the Ahlul Bayt are there. 124,000 prophets attend as participants in Karbala to greet the pilgrims and the visitors of the shrine of Imam Al-Hussein, which is why the hadith says anyone who visits Imam Al-Hussein on the 15th of Sha'ban is like one who shakes the hands of 124,000 prophets. We will make sure we're there if we can. We will try to connect with the Imam. And in doing so, we will be part of the solution as opposed to being part of the problem. You see, most people are part of the problem. Most people are in the camp of darkness, not the camp of light, true light. The day the Mahdi returns is the day the earth will shine with the light of its Lord such that his light will permeate through every room in every home in every part of the world as the hadith tells us right we will not be part of the problem part of the camp of darkness most of us have built our lives in such a manner so as to maximize joy and pleasure and minimize pain at the expense of our morals and our faith and our values, who cares about those? As long as I make some extra profit, as long as I enjoy myself a little bit longer. But to what end, so what? So that we could enjoy ourselves in this swamp? Imagine, once again, go back to the tadpole. The tadpole tries to steal something from another tadpole or hurt someone, another tadpole as well. <laughs> or takes a little bit more food than it should. So what? So it can be in this swamp a little longer? Let's stop being part of the problem and be part of the solution. Be members of the camp of the one who will bring about justice and true pleasure, true security, serenity, joy. Live until we see a thousand children as the hadith says. A thousand. Live in prosperity, both spiritual and physical, in the age of the Mahdi, inshallah. May Allah bless us all. May Allah illuminate our eyes by having a glimpse at the beautiful face of our Master, inshallah, by hastening his reappearance. Allahumma ajjal li waliyik al faraj. والعافية والنصر واجعلنا من أصحابه وأعوانه ومقوية سلطانه أمين رب العالمين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجه ابن الحسن روحي فدا متى ترى نابنا روك ان يوسف الزهراء بيام في تو شبت آلم حلا ندارد جز تو کس افتادیم آقا از نفس تنها تو را داریم و بس یبن الحسن روحی فدا Yabnal Hassan Yabnal Hassan